Welcome to Good Dog Nation, the weekly video podcast that's all about having a good dog. Hosted by Michelle McCarthy, CDBC, CTAC, Leading Therapy Dog Authority, and owner of Canine Homeschooling. And Kim Merritt, co-founder of GoodDogInABox.com, GoodDogPro.com, and founder of the URL Doctor. This episode is brought to you by GoodDogInABox.com, reward-based dog training and dog bite prevention products for families with kids and dogs. And GoodDogPro.com, the online content subscription and community for dog professionals with reward-based dog training products, curriculums, and online courses to educate, motivate, and positively impact those that work with dogs. Now, let's join Good Dog Nation. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Good Dog Nation. I am Kim Merritt, co-founder of Good Dog in a Box and Good Dog Pro, and I am here with my co-host, Michelle McCarthy of K9 Homeschooling. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Hi. Hi, everybody. Good. We have a very, very special guest today and a really interesting topic, dog to human aggression. And we are joined today by Dr. Amy Pike. Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? So before we get started, let me read to everybody Amy's very interesting bio. And I just said to Michelle, I was going to cut this down, but then it's like, no, it's really interesting and relevant. So I want to read the whole thing. So Dr. Pike graduated from Colorado State University of Veterinary Medicine in 2003. After graduation, she was commissioned as a captain into the United States Army Veterinary Corps. It was taking care of the military working dogs returning from deployment that spurred her interest in behavior medicine. In 2011, Dr. Pike started a residency program under the mentorship of Dr. Deborah Horwitz, DACVB. In October 2015, Dr. Pike passed the ACVB certifying examination. Dr. Pike is the owner of the Animal Behavior Welfare Center in Fairfax, Virginia, suburb of DC, where she sees referral behavior cases. She is a clinical instructor for the online education system eTraining for Dogs, a member of the Fear Free Advisory Committee, and a certified animal behavior consultant for IAABC. She was recently named one of the top veterinarians of Northern Virginia by Nova Magazine for the third year in a row. So welcome, Amy. Thank welcome. you. Welcome. And Michelle, I'll let you start the questioning since you are the dog sure. trainer. So we want to start by just having you explain what is a veterinary behaviorist? How is that role different from your traditional general practice vet? Yeah, so a veterinary behaviorist is a specialist in um, behavior medicine. So if you think about in the human world, we are essentially the psychiatrists of, um, of the dog veterinary world dog and cat, um, but the veterinary world. So we have all gone to veterinary school. We've graduated from an accredited um, vet school. We've done residency programs, just like a you know doctor, human doctor would go to do a residency in psychiatric medicine and then um, practice as a psychiatrist. So that's essentially what we are um, is, you know, we do that for the our dog and cat patients. Okay. And what is the process? So from the time a veterinarian decides they would like to pursue that, how, how do they go about doing it and what does that look like? Yeah, so there's a couple different options in, in terms of how you can do a residency. Um, there's what's called a non-traditional, which is what I did, where a um, boarded veterinary behaviorist takes you on as their resident in their private practice and you have to do 400 cases you have to write three case reports. You have to publish research in a peer-reviewed journal about something in behavior medicine, and you have to uh, uh, pass a two-day examination at the end of the process. So that's a non-traditional residency, whereas a traditional residency is done at a university setting, um, much like a, you know, like a veterinary cardiologist or or someone of that nature would go to a university, do a three-year program there and um, then do the same, the case reports, the research, and pass the exam. So okay. I'm just curious how many of you there are yeah, in so the U.S. Are, are there lots of vets that have this distinction or not so many? Not so many. Um, there are now 84 veterinary behaviorists in all of North wow. America. Um, wow. And several of those actually have moved to other countries. So we have a couple in Europe, um, you know, obviously don't practice over here. And then we have a couple in Australia as well. So wow. not so, so many. So, so how do we know if our vet has this distinction? 
So there are going to be letters behind the name. So for a veterinarian, we have DVM, which is the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, or a VMD if you graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and then a veterinary behaviorist will have the letters DACVB, which stands for a Diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Behavior. Interesting. Okay. So one question I have, and I think a lot of times, even when I'm working with clients, and I refer them off to a, a vet behaviorist. You know, I, I do behavior consultations. I'm, I'm a certified behavior consultant. I'm, I don't have a master's degree. I work, you know, I was certified through the IABC. So I'm always very clear with my clients. You know, these are, this is my skill set. But often I have clients that I feel very strongly need to be seen by a vet behaviorist. And people will always say, well, why is that a big deal? You know, my, my traditional vet, said that they think that they can solve the problem. Um, how do we convey to our clients, what is that, why is it so important that a vet behaviorist be boarded? Right, so there are several, you know, some clients uh, that may feel comfortable with behavior medicine, but they haven't undergone the, the level of training that we have undergone. Um, it would be like going to see your family practitioner for a brain tumor. You wouldn't want to go, you know, have them do surgery, right? You're going to go to a boarded neurologist and neurosurgeon. Very similar, right? You're not, you, your general practitioner may dabble in psychiatric medicine, like maybe be able to put you on Prozac, but if that doesn't work, um, then they may be at a loss. And that's sort of where we come into play is, one, we take the whole animal into account in terms of, is this a medical disorder? Because as veterinarians, we diagnose and treat those, as well as what medication um, or products interventions would be best for that patient. Right. I know I'm often trying to explain to people that as, as a veterinary behaviorist, you have much more understanding of how to use medication, how medications can interact with each other, exactly. and how to monitor that animal on those medications. I meet clients, unfortunately, whose dogs are on very unusual cocktails of yeah. You know, you know, prescription medication, and then they start kind of going on the internet and adding in yeah. natural supplements because they read something somewhere on Facebook that said it was a right. good idea. And you know, I've I've had just general practice vets become very concerned because they don't even understand how all these meds are interacting with each other. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and so I, I try to always explain. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have that's to your role. System. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. We know we. Know you know, cytochrome system, which is a, just a big fancy word about how it's metabolized. And um, we know what interactions, drug interactions, potential or, um, you know, most common are going to happen. And it's just, it's one of those things where, you know, you learn so much in veterinary school, we have to learn about 12 different species of animals through veterinary school. And, you know, we joke that we're better doctors because they only have to learn one, right? Um, and so now we know all of this stuff, but we haven't really delved in, in depth into, you know, various organ systems like the brain. And the brain is an organ just like the heart, and there are specialists for every single organ system in the body. Yeah. So does a vet behaviorist or the majority of your clients, uh, are you using medication with them or not necessarily? I would say the majority of, our, of my patients do get medication um, or, and or natural products, depending on um, the case or the owner's wishes, um, mostly because what I can do, Michelle can do too, in terms of the training behavior modification piece, um, we're both you know, IABC certified. And so we've gone through that certification in terms of our training and behavior modification um, qualifications. And then the, as a veterinary behaviorist, the sort of added level of what I can do for one of her clients is that, you know, we can prescribe the appropriate medications to help really decrease intensity and frequency of behaviors and um, better the, the patient's recovery if they get triggered. So are you kind of the last resort in a lot of cases? <laughs> I, I unfortunately am. I wish we were sort of the first stop along the way um, and, and much, much sooner than a lot of these uh, patients get referred. Um, but I do get told that I am the last resort by clients. They're, they're on the verge of euthanizing um, if we can't help. And, and so, you know, medication sometimes, uh, unfortunately, is a last resort. I wish it would be much sooner in the process, to be honest. 
So in your practice, um, you know, always look at your website and it looks like you have a, a great team. Yes. Um, can you share like who, who's part of your team and what yeah. are their roles? Yeah, so we have um, myself and another veterinarian who's in her residency. So she's doing a non-traditional residency with me currently. Um, we have two veterinary nurses who are um, licensed vet techs or LVTs, uh, one of whom actually has her specialty in uh, behavior as well. So there's a vet technician specialty in behavior yeah. um, and they're only 11 of them. So she's one of, <laughs> yeah, she's even smaller group. Um, so we have the two nurses and then we have three trainers um, on staff as well. So we have a Jean Donaldson Academy graduate. We have a CPDT um, and CBCC KA um, trainer. And then we have one of my trainers is actually has a bachelor's in um, human psychology and has come on as wow. um, one of our dog trainers. So it's a good Great. team. It's like the psychiatrist and the psychologist and the social worker all working together to, you know, help the patient. Yeah. So you can really offer a client the entire process. Yeah. Because um, one thing, Absolutely. yeah, the one thing, you know, that I find myself explaining to people, um, and I'm sure you can do a, a much better job of doing that is, is behavior modification and training the same thing? Oh, yeah, that's, it depends on who you ask, right? What their definitions are. <laughs> so in my uh, mind, training is more like the obedience type stuff. Like you do a sit, you do a stay, a down, et cetera. Um, whereas behavior modification is really focused on changing the emotional underpinning of a behavior. So instead of lunging and growling at strangers because I don't like them, what should I do instead? And let's counter condition them to actually either enjoy strangers because they bring me chicken or cheese or whatever the case may be, or at least be neutral um, towards them. So it's more about changing an emotional state than just uh, performing a cue. Right. You know, they're just so different to those of us that, that work. You know, we know that teaching a terrified dog to mm -hmm. sit when he really is just wanting to run and hide, right. it's not really fixing the problem. No, no not and, at all. <laughs> and it's very challenging, as you know, at times. To, to try to help people understand that. Yeah, I mean, the training field is so unregulated, as you know. So anyone yeah. can call themselves a trainer. Um, veterinarians can't call themselves veterinary behaviorists until they're actually board certified, like myself. Um, so yeah. even like my resident, she has to say practice limited to behavior. Um, she can't call herself a veterinary behaviorist because she's not boarded yet. But anyone can call themselves a trainer. Anyone can call themselves a, quote, behaviorist. Um, mm -hmm. And have absolutely no background knowledge in the actual subject. I know it's very frustrating. I know myself, I've worked now for 20 years and, yep. and I'll even correct people that say, Oh, you're a behaviorist. And I'm like, no, I'm not a behaviorist. Yeah. I'm yeah. a behavior consultant. And there's to me a very big difference. Yeah. And well, I've always you. deferred. That. <laughs> yeah. And for years, you know, I've, I've had great partnerships with a couple different vet behaviorists and, mm -hmm. and the vets that I work with have good relationships. So we have this really good protocol of yeah. trying to work as a team, but there's such a need, I think, for trainers and people who are even behaviorists mm -hmm. to rely more heavily on doctors such as yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. That you're really helping us do our jobs better, but we have to defer to you and seek out more direction yeah. and not take on these very dangerous cases. I'll have trainers share with me some of the cases that they'll take on. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's terrifying because people's safety is at risk. The dog is at risk. Yes. And there yeah. seems to still be, as you said, because it's unregulated industry, it's kind of the wild west of training sometimes. Absolutely. And scary. So from the dog owner's standpoint, how does how does an owner know that it's time to come to see somebody like you? So they may have been told by their primary care veterinarian, they may have approached them and said, hey, you know, my dog is doing X, Y, and Z, and they're, the primary care veterinarian may refer them. I often get trainer referrals um, from trainers who know that this goes beyond their skill set or that the animal is going to need medication before they actually can truly learn. And so um, those are all 
great ways is talk to professionals in um, in the field. But if your pet is you know anxious or fearful or showing any sort of aggression, because the majority of those stem from fear, um, which we can help with, then that is definitely the time to seek out um, a qualified professional. So in your experience, our, our topic today is dog to human aggression. How prevalent is that in your practice? It is the number one thing to see. Um, I'm, I have a very skewed view, obviously, in terms of prevalence in the greater community, but I do think it's a, a big issue. Um, you know, we live in D.C., Northern Virginia. It's very, very crowded here, both people and it's very dog friendly, but um, we see a lot of dogs with uh, dog to human aggression, whether it be towards their own or towards, um, strangers. So when you look at a client coming in, um, you know, how how bad does it typically have to get before the average person will even say this is aggression? Some people, yeah. as you know, they kind of miss, oh, he's just so happy, gets overexcited. Yeah. Um, and they start labeling. How do we help people understand? And maybe you can help us to clarify, you know, what falls into that category of this is aggressive behavior. It's not just reactivity, which right. is another big word that gets thrown around. Right, right. I, I mean, I always tell people if the dog, dog or cat is trying to increase distance between whatever they find scary, that's aggression, however they do it, whether it be barking, growling, snarling, snapping, or eating. Some people don't want to um, classify it as aggression. Lay people don't want to classify it as aggression until there's an actual bite. But any strategy to try and get rid of your um, your fear is is potentially an aggressive strategy. Um, whether that be that could turn into a bite depending on the circumstances. And so, you know, sooner rather than later, people need to be coming in because um, you definitely don't want to let it get to the point where the dog feels like they have to use biting as um, a strategy. So a lot of what the, the average pet owner sees as, oh, my, my puppy, he's just, he's just shy. Um, you know, he's slow to warm up. Mm -hmm. And so some of those subtle behaviors are, are really, really falling more into, this is a dog who's trying to communicate with you very clearly. Yeah. I do not feel good about what's going on right now. Exactly. And, and fear is a precursor to outright aggression because that's where it stems from. That's the emotion that's driving that behavior. And we do see a lot of dogs that come in around age two or three, which is behavioral maturity. That's when dogs become adults and they may just have started showing some aggression, barking, snarling, et cetera. But come to find out, you know, in the first three years of their life, they were very, very fearful. And now that they're an adult, they feel more confident. They know that aggression works as a behavioral strategy. Mm -hmm. And so the owners are starting to see this. So if we can intervene, you know, early on when that puppy is fearful, then we can help that dog grow into a, you know, a you know, good member of our society because they are not scared anymore. And is there anything in particular you have as advice to the dog owner, not the professional, but the dog owner about what to do with their dog, their puppy when they first get it or in the first several weeks and months to try to avoid some of these behaviors later on? Mm -hmm. It's well, it's really important that we have um, good socialization during that early formative up to about 16 weeks of age. That's when um, dogs are more receptive to new people, new places, new things, and they need to be exposed to those things in a very positive fashion. If, if they don't see a lady wearing a hat with an umbrella up to six week, 16 weeks of age, when they see it at age one, they're going to be like, wait, what is this crazy thing, right? So getting enrolled in puppy socialization classes, um, you know, going to puppy play dates at your veterinary, your veterinary hospital, those types of things are very, very important during that really key period of time. And then if you see any sort of fear, addressing that sooner rather than later, because again, that fear could potentially um, migrate to aggression later on. And when somebody would first see that, is it somebody, is it a reward-based trainer? Is it somebody like Michelle, a behavior consultant, or is it a veterinary behaviorist that somebody should start with? 
I, I would say it depends on the the extent of the fear. So, um, you know, definitely want to use positive reinforcement based training regardless. And so good so puppy socialization classes can be run by, um, you know, positive reinforcement trainers. But if we're seeing that fear, the likelihood is that we need to go to that next step and we need to go to a behavior consultant, if not a veterinary behaviorist um, to intervene. Many, many years ago, I was called to a client's home. Um, they just gotten a puppy and this puppy, they said, well, we're really concerned about him. He's not like any of our other dogs. And I showed up at their home. This puppy had probably the worst resource guarding. Oh. I've never seen that in a puppy, a 10 week old puppy. And they were, they were afraid of him. Mm -hmm. I've never had a puppy make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And you know, I immediately said to them, this is so severe mm -hmm. that you need to immediately go to our local vet behaviorist. Mm -hmm. And they no, we think if we just socialize him and if we do all these things and and it was really hard news for me to give them because nobody wants to hear that about their puppy that they just brought home. And when they shared his background, there were probably contributing factors to where he came from, how he had been whelped and raised. Um, but it was a very scary situation. Long story short, they didn't get to the vet behaviorist till he was almost two and he was euthanized at three after his fourth very severe bite. Um, and it was heartbreaking. And, you know, trying to change people's mindset about even puppies can need immediate intervention. Mm -hmm. um, the best leader. chance <laughs> the, the best chance they have is when they're 10 weeks old. Absolutely. If you identify something really kind of going sideways. Absolutely. Um, it, but it's hard news to give someone. Because nobody wants to, you know, think about putting their puppy on Prozac or, you know, whatever other medication. But honestly, that's the best time to do it because they're so neurologically malleable. Like we can, you know, manipulate those neurons to help them so much so that at age three, we're not euthanizing for this behavior. Like we, we have potential the sooner we get in there and help out. So one question I have for pet people, because this comes up a lot, mm -hmm. but I can't take my puppy out and socialize them. My vet said they have to be fully vaccinated, which puts them at four to five months of age. Right. And maybe so how do we, months. maybe older. So how do we, I mean, I know how, what I say to people, I start pulling down all the AVMA, you know, <laughs> flyers. Um, but how do we help people understand you have a better chance of, of treating kennel cough than you do of, of fixing inadequate socialization. Absolutely. So it used to be that veterinarians, and I, I mean, I've been in this field long enough that I was one of those veterinarians that said, you can't take your puppy anywhere until it's fully um, vaccinated because of the risk of diseases like parvo and distemper. But be, socialization is like vaccinating for future behavior problems. That's what I think about it as. And the risk of those viruses is very, very low, if not next to zero in a very well-run socialization class. So there was actually a study done out of UC Davis looking at the risk of parvovirus um, in puppies that didn't attend socialization and those that did. And there was absolutely zero risk across the puppies that attended puppy socialization classes. So we use disinfectants that kill those diseases. Puppies have to have been in the household long enough that if they have broken with any sort of, you know, vomiting or diarrhea or upper respiratory issues, we will have caught it by then. Um, and no puppy is allowed in class if they're feeling ill. And the owners have to sign a, you know, for like our class, the owners have to sign a contract that says, if my puppy is ill, I will not bring them in until they've been checked out by my veterinarian. So it's very important that we get those puppies out and about you know, you're not taking them to dog parks where you don't know the, the vaccinatory of um, the dogs that attend there. You're going to a class where other puppy owners, responsible puppy owners are getting their pups vaccinated. They're coming from, you know, reputable sources and they're, see they're seeking veterinary care if they have any issues. So it's really, really important that we just get rid of that myth of don't take them anywhere because it's, it's key. I used to get a lot of kickback in my puppy class. It was a four week, like straight play structured group. Mm -hmm. But I made people commit to during that four weeks, they would not go to daycare with their puppy. They wouldn't go to the groomer. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't go to a dog park. 
they would just play in clean environments like their backyard, have people come to your yard and play, but then don't have a dog park dog come to your house and play right. um, just for just for four weeks. And I and I I didn't feel it was unreasonable because we give the puppies the much needed socialization and we minimize the risk. Absolutely. Um, but it's so important for people to understand um, you know, you can you can treat them for some vomiting and diarrhea. And those did parvo, it is very dangerous yes. if a puppy gets it. But it's a lifetime of horrible stuff if they're not socialized. Absolutely. Yep. I think it's worse. <laughs> I do too. I'd rather I've treat parvo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm curious and I know exactly what M Michelle and my view is, but I'd love to hear from your point of view. Why does a dog owner want to use reward-based training versus shock collars and choke collars and prong collars? What what do you see and, and what's your reasoning for recommending reward-based training? Um, I mean, there's so many reasons why, but the first one being a better bond with your animal. Your, your pet wants to work with you because you're giving it a paycheck at the end of the day, just like, you know, I I like my job, but I'm not going to come do it without my clients paying me, right? So it just is that bond and um, facilitates a very, very nice relationship. Whereas punishment, um, it can potentially increase fear and anxiety, which is the last thing we obviously want to do for um, our pets, but it can ruin that relationship because the dog doesn't trust you and um, is afraid that, you know, you're going to use these um, tools on them. Absolutely. What is your thought? You know, it's very becoming more popular here in Michigan where I live, but a lot of people get their puppy and they want to ship them off to boot camp yeah. for, <laughs> for three to four weeks. And, you know, I have people not as much anymore, but would contact me. Oh, can you take my puppy for a month and just send it back when it's trained? Right. And, and it comes back to what you said. It's like, how can you bond during that critical time? Yeah. If, you don't even have the puppy. And then how do you know how your puppy is truly being handled? Exactly. And the majority of boot camps, I don't know about Michigan, but around here, we only have one um, send away camp that's actually positive reinforcement based. Um, everything else uses shock collars and prong collars. Same here. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that you don't see how your puppy is treated. But I always tell, um, you know, people, I could take your dog home and do xyz over the next two weeks it's more about me training you and then you bonding with your pup through this process and that's yeah. really what is key there absolutely can you speak on genetics and how much that plays a part into aggression and and, and what you treat yeah, absolutely. So it, it is nature versus nurture, and there's a combination of the two that factor into behavior. Um, we think about 30% of behavior comes from a genetic, a genetic component of some sort, and whether there's like an environmental um, influence on that gene or um, it's a standalone type thing, we're not entirely sure. We haven't really teased all those pieces out, but we do know that like working ability, um, let's say in our, like our military working dogs or our police dogs comes from the mother's side of um, the gene line. We think that fear and anxiety potentially come from the father. We know friendliness in cats actually comes from the father's um, line. And so genetics hmm. definitely can play a role in um, what we see behavior wise. And so I always tell people if they have not seen the mother or the father when they're picking out a puppet, let's say a breeder, um, that's a big red flag for me because I want to know how those animals behave. And what would you what would you say to somebody? What do they want to look for? Yeah, so you want to look for sociable animals, right? Does is the mom, you know, willing to um, come up and approach and interact with you as, as a stranger, or you know, have you interact with the puppies? Are you, um, you know, not allowed to see the father because he's, you know, in a kennel somewhere and barking and lunging and growling at the kennel door, and you're not allowed to go over there? That's, you know, obviously a huge risk factor for a potential aggression in the future. Um, but then in terms of the puppy's behavior too, you want to look for the pup that is 
um, you know, social and plays with its um, litter mates and approaches you. I always tell, um, I always get owners, they'll say like, I picked this puppy out because she was the quietest one. I was like, yeah, that's probably because she was so shy. <laughs> she yeah. didn't want to approach at all. And so she was nice and yeah. shut down. And um, that's a big red flag uh, right there. So definitely one of the ones that's the bouncy, crazy puppy, because that's what you want at that age. Yeah. And it's hard when people, whether they're working with a rescue or shelter or breeder, people tend to go in looking for the, for something that really is not what they want long term. Right. You know, right. oh, he had the prettiest eyes, but he was hiding in the corner right. or, <laughs> you know, she was the color we liked, but she was barking hysterically when you came into the room mm -hmm. and people really feel that that's just how puppies are and that they'll outgrow it. Yes, I, I hear that a lot. Like, well, aren't they just going to outgrow it? And you don't outgrow behaviors like that. You absolutely grow into them if nothing is done to them or for them. So, so Amy, as we're as we're wrapping up uh, for uh, the show, can you give a top couple tips to dog owners as to you know what they can what they can do? to prevent this and then also what they want to look for to get to you before it really becomes a problem. Yeah, so prevention, you know, we already talked about the, the socialization factor if you have a puppy, but um, making sure that you're only using positive reinforcement based training because um, we know that punishment, whether it hurts or not, um, punishment can increase fear and anxiety and, and that can lead to potential aggression in the future. Um, so those key pieces. And then in terms of, um, you know, what can you do and when should you, you know, do something, the sooner, the as soon as you see any signs of fear, anxiety, or stress in your animal, whether it be at the veterinary office or uh, a loud noise, you need to ask your veterinarian, ask a um, positive reinforcement-based trainer or a behavior consultant, or of course, ideally, behaviorist um, to intervene so that that doesn't get out of hand and um, end up in with issues that are, you know, potentially in the euthanasia. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing you. your, your wonderful wealth of knowledge with us. Thank and uh, thank you for watching. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. If you'd like to participate in the rest of today's conversation for professionals who work with dogs, and receive continuing education credits from participating organizations for listening, visit gooddogpro.com and subscribe today. Use coupon PODCAST to get 40% off your first month or annual subscription.